You know, every now and then it gets a little too cozy around here. And I feel like we need to just shake the barrel, as Meemaw would say. And what better way to shake the barrel than just talk about the best college football programs in college football. Uh, not just necessarily how anyone would rank them, but how we would rank them. Special criteria. We're jam-packed. High atop a vibrant downtown Nashville, Tennessee. It's the first show we've done in Nashville in roughly like nine years, it feels like. I know the studio looks weird. I'll explain it in a second. But we're going to break down the best programs in college football tonight. We did this for conferences a little while ago. And everyone just pulled out the knives in the comment section. So I figured, why not? Something that divisive must be delicious April content. So why don't we bring that out tonight? I've got you some under-the-radar quarterbacks, a metric ton of intel and scoop and dirt from all around college football uh, spring practices. Things are going to get chaotic. I know we have spoken about it, and I'm going to continue to speak about it. We won't have to speak about it much longer because in about another week, that's when the portal opens up. And uh, whomst, whomst amongst us knows, the world may never be the same again. Can a defensive player ever win the Heisman? If so, I may have four or five of them. Just let me dream on that, please. I know what the answer probably is, but let me dream tonight. I got three or four, five names to throw at you. And also, just this entire concept of spring games, spring practice. What does this time of year mean? How is it different now? Is it different now than it ever has been? A lot of questions in the intro. Let's get some answers. They're watching us in Round Rock, Texas, Delray Beach, Florida, Valentine, Nebraska, Foster, Quebec, Canada. Thank you guys so much. Uh, as I said, we're jam-packed. What's happening? If you're listening on podcast, nothing. It all sounds the same. If you're watching on YouTube, it looks a little different than the normal studio. That's because the normal studio is dust now, and uh, they're building us a brand new one up here. It is show number 500, and what is it, Colin, who's three states away from me right now? We've already been through three studios, four studios, or something like that. The next one should be the brightest and shiniest. Uh, as is usually the case, that's because of you guys supporting the show. So we're getting a lot of new bells and whistles. In the meantime, we've been on the road. We're going to continue to be on the road. I am briefly back home, high atop downtown Nashville, Tennessee. So don't get used to this. You may see it a few more times, but don't get used to it. Um, we're going to be at three different programs next week. The Pate State Speaker Series, we've already knocked down double-digit stops. We're going to go to three more next week. Very, very exciting times, and we have gotten a ton of good feedback. Obviously, when you sit down with head coaches, it's pretty easy to get good feedback, but if you've missed out on that, I strongly encourage you, just, just like free time during your day, we've got an entire playlist of all the sit-downs we've done, the conversations with head coaches. It's on the YouTube channel right now. You can go find them. Some of them have been on the show, but not all of them. Some of them we've been doing on Wednesdays, and those don't go in the full-length shows. Uh, we're going to do that again next week. So I think you'd probably take a lot out of those, even if you're not a fan, or even if you don't care about the particular program and the particular coach we sit down with. Having said that, most of you care because we're sitting down with the biggest names in the sport, and several more to come. All right, here we go. Uh, here goes nothing, as they would say on the streets. Um, I just want to give you my top programs in college football. And I want to give you the disclaimer. Here's what I care about. As we know, these rankings are going to be above reproach. The JP poll is spitting them out. The JP poll gets dusted off once a spring. And we're doing full program breakdowns. An announcement that I'll probably use in Twitter replies later. This is not meant to be predictive. It's not meant to forecast where you will go in the coming years. It's meant to reflect what you have been and what you are here and now. I value, when defining a program, a three to four year rolling blend of on-field results, how much have you won, talent acquisition, how good are you recruiting and portaling, how good are you developing that talent, the resource pool you have at your disposal, and overall synergy or togetherness of your program and to a larger degree, your athletic department. That's how we define programs. The number one program in college football right now is the University of Georgia. Not sure it takes too long. We didn't need the drum roll on this. 42 and three with two titles over the last three seasons kind of speaks for itself. I think it's the top coaching staff, pound for pound in college football right now. Kirby Smart, I would power rate as the number one head coach in college football right now. It's the second layer with Georgia, ironically, that's the most impressive to me. Sure, everyone sees the talent. Everyone sees the NFL draft pick assembly line. Got a premier head coach. Uh, got top flight coordinators and assistants. It's the second layer, though. 
It's the names you don't even know. You know, like when Del McGee got hired away from Georgia at Georgia State, the biggest fight they had on their hands at Georgia was Dell came for the second layer guys, the assistants and the backups here and there that you don't even know. Most Georgia fans don't know, but they're quality people. That's why they're in that building. They're strong beneath the top layer. They're strong. And obviously when it comes to roster, we would just call that depth. It's also... I think probably the most intense environment to work in or play in in college football, and it yields results like you've seen over the last couple of years. Georgia number one, Alabama number two program in college football right now. There is a lot of thought out there that once Nick Saban steps aside, then you've got to reset this. Well, as I said, this is not predictive, but if it were predictive, I'm not sure I'd change a whole lot. So let's just say for the sake of argument, we're taking predictive modeling into account here. They've got two SEC titles the last three years, but that was under Saban, right? Uh, they lost a legend. I think they added an elite head coach. We had Kalen DeBoer on the show last week. Met with a lot of his, met with the vast majority of his staff on and off the record last week. So got a good look under the hood early on of the new Alabama program. I want you to know something though. You just watched him in the final four in basketball. I have a resource theory about Alabama. Uh, it actually goes like this. They didn't have to realize their resource potential under Saban because he was Saban. And so there's a misnomer out there, and this is a theory of mine, that Bama doesn't quite have the top end on the old NIL speedometer that some of the other programs have, and they don't have that deep resource pool that some of the other programs have. Could be true. What I do know is they haven't needed it. And so now you'll have a little different strain put on that fan base and especially the deeper pockets in that fan base than has been in the past. I actually think they're going to be all right on that front. I think they're going to be all right in recruiting. Talent acquisition period has been elite. I think it will remain, whether it's elite or not, in the top five to seven range in college football. That's actually an interesting side point that we could talk about all day. But when Kalen DeBoer came there, uh, I also think that he brought a very, very good staff. And even with the losses of Grubb and Huff, I still think it's a really good staff. But that's all, that's all predictive. So I'm trying to explain to you, I'd still buy into them being the number two program in the country, even if this were predictive. But if we're just looking at the last three years, rolling blend, record, talent acquisition, resource pool stability, yeah, Alabama's way up there. I've got, well, I've got a shameful admission for you when it comes to number three. In fact... I changed this in the last, what, Jesse, two hours, I think. And producer Jesse and director Colin aren't even in the building. They are down in Fort Lauderdale. And so I, the only way I can hear them is in my ear. And the only way I can talk to them is via phone and text. You remember a couple of, well, probably like a month or two ago now, we did this, but we did it for conferences. So I put out my Big Ten program rankings, basically the same criteria. And I had Ohio State ahead of Michigan. I explained my thinking. Some people agreed, some people disagreed. I am now disagreeing with myself. Probably the first major flip-flop, not to be the last, that I am admitting to in the year of our Lord 2024 is, I think I messed that up. So I'm putting Michigan as the number three program in college football right now. It is not predictive. So anyone who wants to talk about Sharon Moore, anyone who wants to talk about how they're gonna fall off, we can have that talk if you believe that. It just doesn't belong here. Uh, here's the bottom line. We've got to value on-field results a lot more than I did the first time around here. I, I think Ohio State recruits better than Michigan. Have they developed as well as Michigan the past three years? I don't think so. Have they beaten them on the field the past three years? I don't think so. And so we got to value that. Like, I didn't value it enough. Uh, there are a lot of other areas where I think Ohio State has the edge over Michigan, and maybe in the future we add on-field results. But in the meantime, there's a bunch of questions, but it's not predictive. And so as, as to where they have been, 13-1, and 15-0 uh, with the national championship last year, and then sent a plethora of guys to the NFL Combine, so they've developed as well as any program in the country. Um, I think that they've recruited good, they've developed excellent, and now they're also going to be met with a ton of doubt. When's the last time a premier program won a title and was doubted as readily as this Michigan program's about to be? 
and I don't know that that really fits into this conversation because that is what it is. Whether they go 0-12 or 12-0 this upcoming year has nothing to do with what I think in the here and now about where their program is. But I moved Michigan up, moved them ahead of Ohio State. Ultimately, all the rest of this stuff is about winning on the field. That's really what it's all about. And you could luck into one, and you could pull an upset as a 14-and-a-half-point dog every now and then. That doesn't prove your program's better than their program. It just proves football happened on a given afternoon. But when you do it again and again and again, and then you cap it off with a championship run, and by the way, you have your pick of where you want to go, and you hire Sharon Moore. They could have gone outside. It's not like they were without options. I have questions about the stability and the depth of their NIL up there. I have questions about just how unstable it turns out. Some of the staffing pieces were after Harbaugh left, but that's, that's for 2024. Uh, this is a here and now look at this. Now, if you couldn't tell, Ohio State, I've got right behind them at number four. So this absolutely will be the biggest debate point in these rankings, and there's negligible difference between the two. If we were doing the just straight up JP poll power rating system, just fractions here and there. But it doesn't matter because one's got to be ahead of the other. Everything's pretty much elite. Everything's on point the way it needs to be at Ohio State, except the on-field piece against Michigan and not having won a national championship, whereas Georgia and like, uh, Michigan have. So you're way up there. Uh, recruiting has been incredible. Defense is now a strength for this program. I think one of the biggest evolutionary points in the Ohio State program under Ryan Day is they are no longer a team any given year that has to outscore folks. That's a big point that probably is not going to get its proper respect until they win a title. And when they win a title, especially if it's this year, Ryan Day will be viewed as a genius and a lot of doubters will have disappeared. But I tell you the thing that they're going to talk about in that future context, if it happens, is, boy, what a tactical move by Ryan Day to, to identify the weak points of his program and bring in Jim Knowles. Well, he already did that. You know, like, it's already two years, three years into that experiment. It works, whether it'll yield a title or not. It's worked. And so that's part of your program. Your development is really good there. Recruiting's elite. A resource pool, I don't really think we even need to talk about that. Got to win a title. Got to beat Michigan. That, that's the only way that they basically climb above where they are right now. Now, I had a little bit of back and forth, paper pop, in my own mind about who the number five program in college football is right now. If you're tuning in live, yeah, it looks like a ranking because it is a ranking. This is not some preseason poll. It's not, you know, who I think is going to win the title this year. I'm talking about programs, and a lot more goes into a program's definition than just what you are in this very moment, and we just ignore what you were in 2022. You can't do that. Otherwise, we're just rating teams, which we can do, and we will do, but we're not doing it right now. I put Texas as the number five college football program in the country, so let me walk you through my thinking on this. The on-field results have started to speak for themselves. They've really started to spike under Steve Sarkeesian. Energy and synergy they're not exactly the same, but they fit because the same can be used to describe both. Excellent. And it's what Texas fans longed for under the previous several regimes, and they've now got it with Sark and his guys at Texas. The sport is built for them right now. Everything that is a strength at Texas, you can do in college football. In fact, I was talking to a very, very distinguished UT alum earlier today, and he said, I wish people would shut up about salary caps and about even revenue sharing. We don't want that at Texas. Forget that. We got it right where we want it, Texas, right now. They're recruiting out of this world. They can portal in whoever they need to. Uh, I think this year's team, it, not that that's what we're talking about now, but this year's team will ultimately go as far as those new imported pieces will take them, which as a fan is always what gives me a little cause to just just not quite put an exclamation point on the end of my sentences in the summer because I do value culture and I do love when guys have come in together and been developed in my program and it always makes me a little leery when I have to go outside the walls of my program for that many pieces. 
but it also is the new world of college football. Pretty much everyone's doing it outside of Michigan last year. Every team in the future that wins the title is probably going to have several notable additions via the portal. Recruiting's there. Resources are there. On-field results are there. Synergy, I think, is there. Here's why my tone changed. There's never been more pressure on Steve Sarkeesian in his life than there will be this point moving forward professionally at Texas. Personal life notwithstanding. There's never been a brighter spotlight on a lot of the guys on that staff now and a lot of guys inside that program than there will be from this point moving forward at Texas. I am cautiously optimistic that this will not be an issue there. I cannot be totally convinced until I see year over year stability with the program. This stuff's not easy. I'm just point blank telling you, this stuff's not easy. If you're in bed at 8.30 every night and it's an apple a day and you get up at 5 a.m. and you're ready to go, uh, these are people and people have flaws. And a lot of times you can fix your flaws and it's wonderful and it's a great story. Other times uh, pressure can expose people. And that's what I'm always cautious about. I'm pulling for him, but that's what I'm always cautious about here. When Bo Davis left there, I looked at it and I said, well, that's, that's interesting, huh? And they added Kerry Baker and they've got a phenomenal staff this year, probably slightly downgraded from last year, uh, but in and of itself, that's not a big deal. I just, I, I don't ignore that kind of stuff is what I'm saying. So I got Texas at number five, because everything I just talked about, even if it is met with a negative ending, is in the future. But it's part of what the program is right now. So, that's not meant to be anything more than it is. That's just me openly and uh, baselessly wondering aloud. Oregon is the number six college football program in the country right now. Double digit wins the last three years. And yet the program doesn't feel like it's arrived, does it? I think they've rapidly climbed program rankings. I mean, I certainly wouldn't have had Oregon number six a few years ago, but yet you watch them come up short against Washington twice last year. Hasn't been a playoff team yet. Hasn't been a national championship team yet, which I think is a really good place to be because elsewhere, resources, it's Oregon. No one's ever going to doubt that. Uh, extremely intense and laser focused staff up there. Lanning is locked into Oregon for the next 150 years. So you got plenty of runway there. You don't have to have the doubts in the back of your head like you did when Mario was up there. Could he one day leave? Well, with Mario, you had reason to think that way. I don't think you have much reason to think that way with Dan Lanning. And then you look at the talent acquisition. I've never seen Oregon recruit like this, ever. There have been some times where Oregon recruited pretty well. They've never recruited like this. And the transfer portal has also met that program at the opportune moment. But the other thing is there's room to climb. So they're, they're sitting number six right now as a program, and there's room to climb. Because the crowd that is 10 or bust, as I like to call them, that's the crowd that thinks if you haven't won a championship, you've never done anything. That crowd looks at Oregon. That crowd looks at Dan Lanning and says, what have they won? What has he won? Well, a whole lot of football games. And he's been a head coach for about 35 minutes also. So it is fair to give guys a little time to get their footing under him. It's only the most tumultuous time in the history of the sport for anybody, much less new coaches. So what has he won? Hey, what have you won? No, I'm not even going to go down that road. That's an apples to oranges. Hey, what about Notre Dame? We all know how this is going to end, but I had to put Notre Dame somewhere. Notre Dame I have is the number seven overall program in college football right now. Double digit wins, not just two out of the last three years, people. They've got double digit wins seven of the last nine years. Josh, they don't play anyone. That's a lie. We've dispelled that myth nine ways from Sunday, so we're not going to do it on this Sunday. Marcus Freeman is the next true star head coach to emerge in this sport. Those of you who are strictly greaseboard football minded do not care about this, but it is the entertainment business after all. And so uh, Marcus Freeman has, has been the perfect guy. Marcus Freeman was the perfect guy at the right time to take classic Notre Dame and mesh it with new college football. They're recruiting better than they did when Brian Kelly was there. They've certainly been more active in the portal. Now, I can't prove to you that Freeman's operating under the exact same conditions that Brian Kelly did. Whomst amongst us knows. Well, 
Maybe we should go up there and ask him. But I'm saying broad strokes purposes, the program's elevated. Not significantly. It's not like it's massively scaled. It couldn't massively scale. They were already in a really good place. But the program's elevated. I mean, you're talking about any given year. Like this year, their over-under win total is 10 and a half. Again, it's not, it's not a predictive ranking here. But that's where Notre Dame has been for a while. Previous staff, new staff. And we're going to talk about them later in the show. But how nice is it that your greatest initial concerns have been alleviated? Like, no one knew how Marcus Freeman was going to fare. You had supreme confidence in him, but no one really knew. Well, now you look and you think all the positives that still could be out there for you, but nobody's really worried whether he's going to be a bust anymore because now we're a few years into it, like Norvell at Florida State. People have long since stopped worrying about whether he's going to be a bust. Now you're just talking about how high he can ascend. I should have put Notre, I should have put Florida State behind Notre Dame. Uh, we'll get to him in a second. I got LSU as the number eight program in college football. I think there'll be a lot of debate as to whether Florida State should have been ahead of them. I'd probably listen to a lot of the debate because I had Florida State ahead of LSU like three hours ago. Uh, But the coin flip went LSU's way. High-end potential at LSU will always be championships. You've seen it with multiple staffs. Some staffs couldn't appear to walk and chew gum at the same time and yet won championships at LSU. So you always know it's possible. It's the inverse of the argument people have about Notre Dame. People look at Notre Dame and think there's a ceiling on the program. I will address that later. No one talks about that at LSU. Like LSU, if it has its own, uh, if it has its affairs in order, then LSU is going to be right in the thick of the national championship conversation. I also look. I, I, um, I think there's some course correction happening in terms of coaching staff at LSU right now. I love what they did defensively. I cannot believe it came to that defensively. I cannot believe that I looked at them last year and watched them have the worst defensive coaching staff in the conference. Just pure numbers, okay? That's not even opinion. That's just pure numbers. Well, they they addressed it in a big way. Now, the, the internal machinations of that and how that process actually happens, I think, is worth an entire book. Uh, Bruce Feldman does a lot of good books on college football. He ought to you know, this is not a good idea, Bruce, so don't do this, but I would be fascinated to read a book that details the actual hiring process. Head coach, coordinators, position coaches, I think it is the thing the public misunderstands the most about our sport. Just just unbelievable. Anyway, uh, LSU nailed it, massively upgraded their defensive staff. I also think resources are top-notch there. Uh, They've won. It's not like they haven't been winning. The the dude came in and beat Alabama and won the West his first year at LSU. Top-end potential is there. LSU is number eight, but LSU can be the top program in the country. So number eight for those folks isn't high enough. Florida State has reason to feel the same way. I've got Florida State as the number nine program in college football right now, and Florida State could be on their way to top five status. You can't do it overnight. Like, I'm not vaulting them up there overnight. But uh, last year, I think in the minds of many, including myself, rooted out any kind of lingering doubt about whether Mike Norvell would be a long-term, like, high-level winner. He will be. I have very little doubt about that. They've secured him. They've locked him up long term. Their recruiting is rapidly improving. Now, unlike some out there, they had the good sense to utilize that portal and get a winning product on the field immediately and then slowly transition to how you construct a roster. I think they've done about as good a job as anyone in in managing roster construction in the new college football, which is funny when you juxtapose it to how some other programs in the ACC have chosen to operate. I think this year is pivotal on many fronts for them. Number one, it's just a year of college football. We don't ever waste those. But number two, you get to find out what Florida State University football is about as opposed to just what the 2023 team was about because you lost a lot of pieces off that. And there are a lot of new faces that have to contribute and emerge And if you turn on Florida State week six or week seven and the product kind of looks the same all of a sudden again this year as it did last year, that is indication of a rock solid culture. Like that's a program more so than just an an isolated team. Like Michigan State a couple of years ago had a ridiculously good team. Program was bad. 
Florida State's not going to be Michigan State. Certainly not my prediction, but that's the difference. That's what you watch for. You watch for different instances that validate your belief. My belief is Florida State is a top 10 college football program right now. And I've still got Clemson as a top 10 college football program. So it could have put Tennessee up here, could have put Penn State, Utah, but I put Clemson still as a top 10 college football program. I think it's important to use the same scale here. By the Clemson scale, it feels like this program's fallen off, so to speak, a lot more than they actually have. So by the Clemson scale, you ought to be right there in the thick of the national championship conversation every year, and they haven't necessarily been that last couple of years. That's not the worst thing in the world. Um, in, in storm chasing, sometimes we have a tornadic supercell. It's already got a history of producing, and then it has to cycle. Or as Bill Paxton and Helen Hunt would say, it has to back build. And then it drops another tornado. Well, Clemson, maybe they're just back building. Maybe they're just cycling. There's no, there's no definitive proof that they've fallen off. And by the way, fallen off is a first world term here. That's why I'm talking about scale. If you use the same scale for Clemson as you do everyone else, they're still winning a lot of games. I'm not putting them in the top five, by the way. So, so don't argue with me they're overrated if you're going to. Preemptively, I'm anticipating that. Don't argue with me Clemson's overrated when I put them number 10 and then use programs like Oregon or Texas. I don't have them ahead of those. But I do have them ahead of, you know, like a Tennessee or a Utah uh, because their, their results have been comparable. And I still think there's a lot to say for the stability there. I think there's a lot to say for the culture there. Now, I think a lot of people have opinions on their talent acquisition strategy and how resistant they've been to really embracing the transfer portal. We've talked about that a lot on the show. Um, difference is Dabo Swinney's not a rookie head coach. So might he be stubborn on this front? Might he be really entrenched in his ways? Yeah. But at least there's a proven philosophy there. And so if he's going to fail, it really will just be because they didn't evolve with the game. But I'm always going to give guys with proven track records benefit of the doubt. It wouldn't be the first time that the sport has sort of left a philosophy behind or passed a philosophy by. But, but it's also well within his right to continue to evolve, too. And just because they've, what, had a 9 or 10 win season last couple of years, I don't start, you know, etching dates on their headstone. I'm not quite there yet. I, I have them well down, like Clemson. Imagine a few years ago saying they're barely in the top 10 of college football programs. Again, it's a very first world slight to throw at someone. They could elevate, they could elevate as well. We'll see. Hearing good things about a, a certain freshman receiver over there, Cade Klubnick offense this year. Garrett Riley, second year as the coordinator, we'll see. So anyway, uh, in, in, in review, Georgia, Bama, Michigan, Ohio State, Texas, Oregon, Notre Dame, LSU, Florida State, Clemson. Those are my top 10 college football programs right now using the aforementioned blend of rolling criteria. It's on-field results, it's talent acquisition, it's stability, it's resource pool, and I'm sure everyone will agree on every single part of this. I see no reason for debate. You know what? Debate anyway. It's fun. It is April after all. Uh, let's roll on. Got a really good live crowd. I am certain we'll have a big replay crowd. Obviously, we're in a temporary studio because uh, they are hammering and nailing our new studio together. It's really pretty. I've seen the renderings. I wear the same t-shirt like eight days out of the week, so I don't need anything fancy. But because you guys have made this the most consumed college football show in digital media, they're giving us something fancy anyway. Show's not going to change. It may just be a little fancier looking, but it's not going to change. But we appreciate it. Spring Intel is my favorite thing to talk about this time of year. I want to go straight to LSU. I'm going to hit several campi, plural of campus, in the next few minutes. They knew they had to diversify the run game down there. When Jaden Daniels was on the field last year, he was the run threat. He was a passing threat. And a lot of times guys could just say, down, set, hut, stand there and we'll see what he's going to do. Well, he's not there anymore. And so no matter who's at quarterback, they know that they're going to have to account for that lost yardage on the ground. And they've got strength. Both sides of the offensive line at tackle, they've got to use it. A lot more outside zone, in other words, is what they've worked on this spring. And I think, think that it'll pay dividends for them this fall. But also, I am uh, more interested 
and more, um, not concerned, but inquisitive about the defensive side in general, because I'm a believer that last year's defensive staff, by way of how subpar they ended up being, probably left a lot of meat on the bone. And that probably means there are some pretty good defensive players at LSU that didn't emerge last year that will emerge this year. Because I can tell you one thing about the staff they got in there now. If they fail, it won't be for lack of quality and for lack of trying. It will simply be they didn't have the personnel. I don't expect LSU to be a top three defense in the SEC. I do think some pretty big names are going to emerge or re-emerge because they'll be used the right way. And that's some of the drum beat and feedback we're getting early on from spring ball down there. And I, I think with LSU, like many, many other major programs out there, is going to have to look to the portal for interior defensive line help when this thing opens in a couple of weeks. And let me tell you, kids, I've been on the road for over a month now. I've sat down with several coaches and several coordinators and folks from collectives and general managers. There are a lot of big spenders that are all about to target interior defensive line. And all of them think they're going to address their needs. And simple math says they're not all going to get what they think they're going to get. But some defensive tackles are about to get a whole lot of money because of that desperation from otherwise premier teams at that position. Glenn West at Go 24-7 uh, helped us out a lot with that feedback. What about Louisville? Louisville we haven't talked a whole lot about on the show. You think Louisville, you think Jeff Brom, you think offense, right? Well, I want you to think defense. Because defense is the strength of this team right now. And in particular, I think the secondary. This could be one of the best secondaries in the country this year. Dare I say that in April about Louisville. Yes, I do. Had to check the eye, Josh, twice there. Quincy Riley was there last year, and he was really good, and he's back. But they added several options that they can rotate now. And I really think that secondary is going to be good, and it better be. Because it will take this offense a little time. And I think it will be a more complimentary kind of team this year. Running back depth is really good there, though. And let me just tell you, Jody Demling hit us up from Cardinal Authority. Isaac Brown is a freshman running back there. If you want to sound smart with your buddies at the water cooler, start talking to them, albeit in a hushed tone, about Isaac Brown. And they're going to say, oh, yeah, I love that kid. And you're going to say, oh, really? Who is he? They don't know who he is. Okay, They just said that hoping you wouldn't call them on their BS. Isaac Brown is a freshman running back at Louisville. He's really good. And I think he could be a star this fall. So keep an eye on him. He's going to get the workload. Keep an eye on him. Maybe, a, it, actually, I think I was a freshman. Whatever. Forget about the classification. He's going to be really good. Uh, Oklahoma. What's happening? Well, we have to check in on offensive line when we talk about Oklahoma because that's what the law says. They lost, it feels like, 100 offensive linemen. Now, the good news, according to our buddies Tom Green and Colin Kennedy over there at Sooner Illustrated, the good news is the offensive guards they have seem to be coming along very well. The bad news is that's only two out of five positions, and their starting center went down with injury and probably won't be back until midway through fall camp. So we have to take what we can get, I guess, right now when it comes to offensive line updates at Oklahoma. Now, the tight end room looks upgraded. And also, Deion Burks is a wide receiver they added from Purdue. That dude's going to be a star this fall. In the SEC, Josh? Yes. In the SEC. In this economy, in the SEC, Deion Burks. I don't know how in the world you buy stock in players. Maybe we'll talk to FanDuel about devising a system, but go, go grab you some Deion Burke stock. I want you talking about Isaac Brown at Louisville. I want you talking about Burks at Oklahoma. What about Kentucky? Remember this time last year was the time when we would have all been whispering to each other, you know, Devin Leary transferred to Kentucky from NC State. Maybe Kentucky's a sleeper. Well, actually what I think we should do is we should be talking about Brock Vandergriff this year. Speaking to some people close to the old program up there, including Aaron Gershon over at Cat Paws, there is a difference between transferring in and actually transferring in and taking a role. Like, yes, Devin Leary got put in the quarterback position last year. The guys who know the program will quickly tell you Brock Vandergriff also transferred in to play quarterback, but he's actually grabbed the role by the throat. 
which is not necessarily something they felt like Leary did last year. Of course, it would have helped to know that last year. It would have saved me some embarrassment. But there's also much more tempo being injected into the offense. So if Brock Vandergriff puts up bigger numbers this fall, it won't necessarily be because he's that much better than Devin Leary. It may be because Bush Hamden was the offense coordinator at Boise, and now he's in there, and they're just going to run a whole lot more plays. It's something apparently Mark Stoops has really prioritized, and I think they'll get it this fall. And, you know, just for fun, before we move on here, I thought it would be very, very uh, helpful for all of us to check in with Boston College. Boston College hired Bill O'Brien as the new head coach. That's one former NFL coach. Did you also know they have Rob Chijinsky up there? Did you also know they have Doug Marone up there? They got three former NFL head coaches on the roster. Does it matter? I, well, it doesn't ever hurt. I don't think it's the end all be all. I think they had to tear a lot of this thing down to the studs and start to rebuild it. Um, look, their over under is five and a half wins. Okay, so a bowl, making a bowl is the win this year. They've got a transfer from Texas Tech, Bradley, the receiver, 6'5". He's probably been the highlight of their spring. A.J. Black over at Eagle Insider was talking to us about him. I think that, you know, that may be a bright spot on the team. But let's just, let's just see what the pulse is. What is the vibe from Boston College this year more so than anything? That's what I care about. We move along. We've got a very, very, um, very eclectic back half of the show here. I was looking for a better word, but I don't ever say eclectic. And uh, frankly, someone bet me five that I wouldn't tonight. So five dollars richer. Let's, um, I got to remind you of something. Okay, so this time of year, I like to do something called the mood tracker. Forget about the explanation. Colin, if you're listening to me down in Florida, I miss you. And also, you can use this as your endpoint for the individual video cut later. The Notre Dame mood tracker want to do it right now. Mood trackers just, here's the thermometer, and we insert it into the entire fan base in a very non-invasive way, a figurative way. And I want to know what the fan base feels. This time of year, we have found it's really productive and gets you really ahead of the curve if you start feeling out the fan base. Because yes, there will be some eternal pessimists and eternal optimists, but the fan base knows the program well ahead of the preview magazine culture. And at Notre Dame, I think the overall mood is just one more rung. One more rung. It is really hard to climb in this sport. Most coaches fail. Most coaching staffs fail. Most players ultimately end up failing because it's really hard to succeed when you're competing at this high level. But even if you do start to climb, it's one thing to climb those first few rungs. But any of us who have ever watched a ladder match Triple H Rock, 1998 SummerSlam being one of my personal favorites. You know that the last rung is the hardest rung. It used to aggravate me to no end, actually, how The Rock would climb a ladder. Because he would climb it ridiculously slow, and he would get still far out of reach of the belt, which is hanging from the roof, because that's how a ladder match works, and he would reach. Why would he reach? I don't know, because the belt is still several feet beyond his grasp. Notre Dame right now is The Rock. Notre Dame is on about the third or fourth rung from the top. Keep reaching for the belt. They're really good. They look great. They're playing great. Uh, they're, they're very competitive, but they're not quite high enough on that ladder to be able to grab the ultimate prize. This fan base wants a national championship. They're not there yet, but they aren't far off. It's just one more rung. Oh, how easy does it sound? One more rung. You ever stood on the top rung of a ladder? I don't advise it all the crash pads and whatnot below you notwithstanding. I don't advise it. It's treacherous up there. It's really treacherous. Meemaw wouldn't even let me climb to the top rung of the step ladder, and no one gets hurt on that thing. So if you're trying to climb to the top of one of those industrial sized ladders, one of those 20 footers, Jeff Hardy, you know, guys like that are the only ones crazy enough to climb those. That's where Notre Dame wants to be. So there's a theory they can't get there. Do you believe that? There's not a right or wrong on tonight's show, I guess, but are you one of those people who believes Notre Dame can't win a national title given the modern construct of college football? Just a side question between me and you, and I'm going to give you my thoughts in a second, but I'll be interested. We should, probably should have put a poll out. I'll be interested to see what you think about that. This is a good place to be for a fan base because you don't suck. You're not terrible. In fact, you're really good. You just want to be great. There's no threat of collapse 
short of like crippling scandal, nothing's probably going to derail Notre Dame football. You got the right coach. You checked that box. You got that out of the way. It's got a really good staff, got a really good plan, really good culture. It's the perfect head coach, like I said, to bridge classic Notre Dame with new age college football. So all that's good. And we're not complaining about that. But there's the ceiling theory that we have to deal with. If I'm a Notre Dame fan, the ceiling theory is very obvious. It's you can be really good at Notre Dame, but you can't be a lead at Notre Dame anymore. You can't win a national championship there anymore. This is not the late 80s. The sports changed and certain parts of it have left you by and they've self-imposed a ceiling that is below championship altitude. I just asked you guys, do you believe that? You cannot afford to believe that if you're at Notre Dame. You can't afford to believe it if you're a fan either. I don't believe it. Granted, I think it's harder there than it is a place like Texas. I don't believe in the ceiling theory because that would indicate it's impossible to win a national title at Notre Dame from this point moving forward, and I don't believe that. I believe it is possible. It's not a prediction for this year or next year or any given year, but I'm telling you I think it's possible there. I think it's possible with Marcus Freeman and his staff. So I don't think any kind of change is needed at the top either. It takes a spark. It's, it's, it's pure like dancing in the dark. You can't start a fire without a spark. But that's really what it takes. And that spark could be one player. It could be one upset. It could be one recruiting class. It could be one coordinator hire. It could be one confluence of events. We watched it happen with Clemson football last decade. And all of a sudden, people went from saying little old Clemson and Clemson's got one of those ceilings imposed on them to all of a sudden Clemson's in the title game every year. It's not an apples to apples comparison, but it is a comparison that fits well enough to use here. The idea you can't win a title at Notre Dame. It, it, well, think about it this way. It, this is where it sounds a little negative, but I don't think it is. The idea that you can win a national championship at Notre Dame does not exist in the minds of a lot of younger kids and recruits. You just have to change the way they think. It's as simple as that. Like I said with Clemson, once upon a time, not too long ago, no one ever looked at Clemson and said, I'm going there because I can win a national championship there. Or if they said it, they got laughed at. But then some kids went there and they won national championships, <laughs> plural. Now no one laughs at that anymore. If they get it done at Notre Dame, no one would laugh at it there. I think it's possible to get it done there. It would take, like I said, the right spark. But if you're a Notre Dame fan, that's all you got left to pull for. Everything else is pretty much in place. It's a really, really rock solid culture. So you can shake the tree as much as you want. You know, some pine cones and leaves and twigs may fall off, but you're not, you're not toppling the tree. So what's left to do? Climb the last rung of the ladder. That's literally what's left to do. I had a question from one of you that I wanted to address because as you know, or I think you know, we've been on the road talking to all these head coaches and you have seen them because the interviews are on the YouTube channel. What I wish I could do, like I told you the other night, is I wish that I could wear one of these, and this is a live mic, because uh, my, my physical mic is stored away somewhere right now. We'll find it. We'll get it back. Uh, but I wish I could wear this or uh, maybe just wear a wire or a miner's helmet, you know, with a camera on it. And I really wish that I could let you guys hear some of the off-record conversation from coaches and uh, GMs and whatnot this time of year. It's fascinating. It makes me, uh, you know, you can envy the paycheck, but boy, the role some of these guys are in, I don't envy it. I don't envy it. Now, with that in mind, Jeff hit me up and said, hey, how important is spring ball in this era of college football? Who knows how many players are still on your roster after spring? You could lose multiple starters and have to start back where from where you started. Uh, yes, Jeff, you can. So spring, to me, is both more different than it's ever been, but also more important than it's ever been. You are about to see the harsh, violent reality of the no rules transfer portal era on full display later this month. I am not overstating this. It will be the wildest transfer portal era that you've ever seen. And it's going to completely gut some of your teams. Just calling it like it is. And some of you are also going to become national championship contenders that don't think you are coming out of spring football. And it's going to be amazing. Well, it's going to be amazing to witness. It's going to be a nightmare to be a part of. So, Imagine the paranoia 
amongst college football coaches right now. I've been knee deep in it lately because I've been talking to him nonstop. Think about the idea that this in spring is the most crucial team building portion of your season and you don't know who your team is. You don't know if you may be giving first or second team tight end reps to a guy that unbeknownst to you has been in contact with half a dozen schools and he's on his way out the door after spring. After spring being the key words there when the hay's already in the barn. The next thing you're going to do is summer workouts, which you are not allowed to observe. And then you, you got some time with them, but by and large, it's fall camp. That's the next thing on the horizon. And all of a sudden, Gary's out the door because he got a better offer from somewhere else. Is it legal? Yes, it is. Is it wonderful for the kids short term? Financially, I suppose it is. Is it good for the sport? No, unequivocally, I would argue it's not for anyone, the players included, because there's more to becoming an elite football player than getting paid in college. That's my personal opinion. I am not lobbying to be sent to Capitol Hill anytime soon. Imagine the paranoia though. The paranoia on how you divide reps. I talked to a coordinator last week who said, my best player we're unsure about at a specific position. He said, we're not giving him first team reps in the spring. We're hoping to send the message to him, but we're really just trying to give reps to guys we know are going to be here. We don't know if he's going to be here. We hope so. We think so. We don't know so. Think about getting accurate intel. How do you know the feedback you're getting from your guys is the real feedback? There is a premier defensive player in the sport right now. Going to be on the cover of a lot of preseason magazines if he stays with his current team. Uh, Going to be on all kind of all-American preseason watch lists. And he's on the market. And I'm not sure his team even knows. It's just, it's the state of affairs right now. Like, that's the condition of college football right now. Think about having to scout other rosters. Other rosters... If you're being real about it, you have to know about. If you're going to lose guys, you have to know who's available. And in some cases, you have to be proactive. We talked to Mac Brown about this a couple of weeks ago. Mac Brown said, I know it's going on. And I know if we did it, we could probably go get some players. He said, I'm just not going to do it. If it costs us games, if it costs us a competitive advantage, but in the interim, it means that we don't circumvent rules. I'm, I'm happy with that. I'm content with that. Most coaches would not echo that sentiment. Or if they did publicly, they'd be lying to you. Because most of them are well down the road of gathering the most intel they can on their guys, finding out their weak points, and then going and proactively scouting and reaching out to other rosters. What's going to happen? You know, what's going to happen? Uh, also, I... I remember last week when we were with Hugh Freeze, he said it really well. Auburn's about to be a huge player in the portal. Auburn is trying to get better on the the defensive line at least. And so, for example, I asked Freeze last week, I said, hey, how do you like this? How weird is it to be going through the latter portion of spring practice and you don't really even know if those guys are going to be on your team this fall? And you could go get pieces that fundamentally alter your football team. And he was like, I don't like it at all, but it kind of is. He said, um, I hate the idea of a 24-hour recruitment. That was a really good way to put it. Never heard anyone put it that way. Back in the day, you know, until like 30 minutes ago, recruitments were multi-year processes where you saw the kid as a sophomore in high school, you got to know his mom, dad, aunt, uncle, sister, nephews, cousins, high school coaches, position coaches, and you forged a relationship, and then whoever recruited him best won out. And now there's guys that... You don't even know are possible ads for your team that all of a sudden are on the radar and you've got to, for lack of a better term, vet them over the span of about 12 to 24 hours. You can't afford to be more thorough than that or else someone is going to cut the corner on you and take them for themselves. And is it legal? Yeah. But legal, illegal. Forget about that for a second. Is that really the best path for college football? It's a horrific path for college football. That's me talking. That's not any of them, although most of them would agree with that. Uh, It's me as a fan of this sport telling you it's not the way it should be. It's not the way it should be. There will be legal minds. There will be NIL-centric folks who, who clip that, and they'll say, well, shame on you for not wanting those kids to get theirs, or, or, well, it's all legal. I know that. I know that. 
it's not what's best. I care about the game. Like I care about what's best for the game. And I don't think that's what's best for the game. Side note, since we're talking about spring games and spring practice, I will make my annual spring game plea when I am college football commissioner. I will heavily incentivize and even plea for real football games or makeshift versions of real football games to be played in spring. Because when I'm college football commissioner, we will finally put into practice the idea that instead of playing FCS teams in the fall, you could and should schedule them as your spring opponent. And I've got CBS and NBC and Fox and ESPN over here who would love the spring inventory. And I've got a big fat paycheck for you FCS teams to come and take your lumps, but also learn valuable information about your team and provide a real life opponent for that team just as you would in the fall, except we're not calling it a regular season game. And how this is not happening is beyond me. So much progress quote unquote, being made in this sport. And yet we're still not playing games for spring. Now, here's what I didn't just say. What I didn't say is when I'm college football commissioner, I will mandate that everyone plays a legitimate opponent for their spring game. I don't care if you do or not, but I want you to, and I'm heavily incentivizing you to, and I will look on you with a favorable eye if you choose to. It should be common sense that you should want to, but you don't have to. You know, it's kind of like um, when I was playing baseball at Harris County, we had voluntary conditioning. You didn't have to. You didn't have to. Uh, Coach Mark Gilrath down there could not legally make you show up at Harris County High School at 5.30 a.m. to run until you puke. It was probably in your best interest, but who's to say you have to? Anyway, let's move on. Now it's really time to dream. I'm going to proactively paper pop it here. The paper pop, for those unfamiliar, is just when things get serious, you need a, a sort of device in the show to make sure people who are listening, especially the podcast crowd, knows that things are serious. Because I could do a segment with no paper pop, and it's just a segment, but all of a sudden, you hear that. All of a sudden, people say, hey, shut up, babe. That was a paper pop. He must be talking about something serious. And he is, he being me. Because Christian hit me up and said, quarterbacks and offensive players are the typical favorites to win the Heisman every year. But is there a defensive player you think could make a case this year? If so, why? Uh, from Woodstock, Georgia. Yes, I've got one, two, three, four, five of them. This is never going to happen. But you need to let me dream on this. Travis Hunter is the most dynamic player in college football right now. Plays both ways. Uh, phenomenal corner. I still am not sure how the NFL views him. I've heard reports, but like I'm really interested to see how the NFL conversation evolves with him this year. But then again, I'm not because I'm a college football guy. Travis Hunter, yeah, if Colorado especially overachieves record-wise this year, he would be a prime candidate, probably in terms of being dynamic, the most likely candidate to be a defensive Heisman guy because it wouldn't just be defense for him. Caleb Downs is another defensive back that I think I need to put in this conversation. So Caleb Downs is at Ohio State by way of Alabama. Caleb Downs, the only thing that I'm waiting to hear about from him is, is he a good fit at Ohio State? Like, do they plug him in that defense and have him look like the star that he is? Because if it's a good fit up there, like if the puzzle pieces connect, the football part takes care of itself. He's one of the best football players in the country last year as a true freshman at Alabama and will be the exact same, if not better, as a sophomore stud in every sense of the word. So Caleb Downs, if Ohio State is a team that wins this year and they are a defensive-minded team, both of which could very well happen, maybe Caleb Downs is the face of that. In a related note, what if LSU is better than expected defensively this year? LSU brought in an, almost an entirely new defensive staff. I'm big fans of the guys virtually across the board. Harold Perkins felt like he disappeared on us last year through no fault of his own. Um, what if he has sort of a resurgent year this year? The raw talent's there. No one doubts that, or if you do, it's very, very ill-advised. But what if that new coaching staff utilizes him in a way that sees him burst back on the national scene? And then maybe that coincides with LSU making a little run in the SEC. If he's the face of that, I could see Harold Perkins being right back in that conversation. But I'll tell you, you're talking about being the face of something? Imagine with me here. Imagine a world 
where Miami's back. Is everyone with me? No. I, I think I already lost some of you. Okay. Well, like I said, just give me benefit of the doubt here for the sake of argument. Imagine a world, it's late November, Miami is clinching a trip to the ACC championship game. They go win the ACC, and Reuben Bain is the face of the team. The first part, you may doubt. But if you grant me that it could happen, how many other guys are equipped to be the face of that than Reuben Bain? Uh, he was one of the best players on the team. He was one of the best football players on their team last year as a freshman. I've been down there to watch a couple of their practices, and especially when they close those doors and you see that dude practice, it's incredible. Like you've seen him play. Just watching him practice. Watch him walk around the building with those other guys. I remember we were down there last year in, I think it was spring, and you're just kind of pointing out the most impressive physical specimens, and then you've got like Cam Gorby over here saying, freshman, freshman, freshman. But then you look at Bain and they go, yeah, yeah, he's different even than the rest of the freshmen. Well, what's his uh, sophomore performance this year look like? We'll see. It takes Miami being back. Part of that conversation is the team part, and then the other part is the individual part. And James Pierce Jr. at Tennessee. <laughs> Paper pop, because I think that's the least recognizable name on this list, but maybe not for long. He was already one of the highest graded players at defensive end in the country last year. I think PFF may have had him as the top graded defensive end in the SEC, but don't quote me on that. Even though I irresponsibly said it, don't quote me on that. It hit Bill Martin with any questions. He's set to become, I think, a household name this year. Now, this is probably the, uh, the biggest reach because if Tennessee has a good year this year, it's probably because offensively they were a juggernaut. And so it may not matter what James Pierce Jr. does. It will to us. But to a Heisman voter, there are Heisman voters who, if you've ever seen the movie Liar, Liar, all Jim Carrey needs to do is write a fib. He's trying to write on his arm on a piece of paper on his desk that the pen is blue and, and the pen keeps going crazy. That's what most Heisman voters' pens would do if they tried to vote a defensive player number one. We all know this, but it doesn't hurt to dream, I don't think. So those are five names I would look at if, if it were to happen, if the impossible were to happen. Those are the five names I'd look at. Now, let's just say it did happen this year. I do want you to be ahead of the curve. So maybe in the interest of dreaming, we go over to FanDuel when the Heisman odds come out, and we just go lay money on all the defensive guys. And then we all claim that we saw it coming. Uh, FanDuel is here to, to sponsor our dreams in that way. It's the exclusive odds provider of Late Kick. I look out our window, and I see other entities in brick-and-mortar form even down on the streets below us. But they're not the partner on this show. FanDuel is. We appreciate them. Going to be fun with them this fall. It was already fun last year, and they were, they were kind of a late addition. They were a late addition to the show. But this upcoming year, got a full year's runway. We're going to do some really fun things with them. You've got, you got a national championship game tomorrow night out in Glendale, Arizona. UConn and Purdue. You can go bet on it right now like 50 different ways. Live bet it for all I care. But give FanDuel a look. Really good dudes over there. Really good people. Just really good people over there. All right, I want to close the show tonight. I got, a, I got an itch on my nose. I keep doing that. And I don't want to just itch it because then there's, there's connotations that people who just want to stir up trouble make about the show. Far be it for us to traffic in that. Oh, shouldn't have said traffic. Anyway, so I want you to look at this question or listen to this if you're on, if you're on podcast. Sooner's rule hit me and said, who are some under-the-radar quarterbacks who could have a big impact on the 2024 season? How do we define under the radar? I think Kyle McCord's under the radar. But yet Kyle McCord started for Ohio State last year. I think he's under the radar because many a college football fan can't even tell me where he's playing right now. Now, if you're listening or watching this show, you, you are diehard and you're not a casual per se and you know he went to Syracuse. They've been getting great reviews from him up at Syracuse during spring. And I don't claim that Pate State is your Syracuse football headquarters or anything like that, but I'm paying attention, and I don't think enough people are. He was a 66% completion rate guy last year. He has big game experience. And you know what? That schedule is not exactly a murderer's row this year. 
So you got experience. Uh, Fran Brown in his first year, the league doesn't know what to expect. Remember when Malzahn walked into the SEC once upon a time and all of a sudden there they are playing for a national championship and people are like, what, what, the high school coach from Arkansas? It can happen that way. I'm just saying if it does at Syracuse, it'll be because of Kyle McCord. How about Will Rogers? Played like 17 years at Mississippi State. Where is he? Quick, quick quiz question there. Where's Will Rogers? Well, he's at Washington now. Lost in all the talk about the coaching transition and the roster churn at Washington is the idea that not only did they get Will Rogers, but he's being put back in a system custom built for him. That wasn't the case last year. It was an oil and water situation in his last year at Mississippi State. But now he's at Washington, and for all of the unknowns around there, one of the things I think I do know is Jed Fish will put Will Rogers in, in an up-tempo, spread-based offense that is perfectly built for his skill set. He could throw 4,000 yards this year. Maybe they go 6-6. Six and six, I don't know, but I think Will Rogers is in a lot better position this year. And even if they don't achieve anything of note record-wise, they play Michigan, uh, they play USC, they play Penn State, they play Oregon. Who could they knock off? That's the other thing to think about. Rocco Becht. I... Yeah, I'll tell you. I'll tell you in a second. Yeah, I'll tell you. Okay, so first, firstly, if you don't know what I'm talking about here, Rocco Beck at Iowa State, one of the most under-the-radar, underrated quarterbacks in college football. He started in 13 games last year at Iowa State, and they're top five in returning production this year. And we were up there a few weeks ago, and I want to tell you, that kid had offers. He's a really good player. He's going to be a really good player, and he could have left there. And he chose not to. And it's not necessarily because dollar for dollar was matched. He's Iowa State. And not only does he know that, not only does his family know that, the locker room knows it. Uh, the building knows it. The coaching staff knows it. So you got a really talented kid there coming into his own. You got a good supporting cast around him. You don't have to worry about how stable he is. He is all in because he's already turned down offers that would have suggested otherwise. And Iowa State this year, they go to Iowa in, or they go to Iowa in week two, and then it's it's a bunch of North Dakota, Arkansas State, Houston. They do not open with a front-loaded schedule. It doesn't mean they can't get beaten, but it means there there's a path there where Iowa State goes from being totally off of everyone's radar except for mine to being in the thick of the Big 12 championship race. Guess who they close with? They end with Kansas State in Ames, 11:30 not a.m. It's November 30th, and they play Utah the week before. So that back, that back stretch is tough, but at least you know what you've got by then. Hey, does anyone know where Tyler Van Dyke is? As it turns out, these were a lot of transfers and Rocco Becht and one more guy in a second. Tyler Van Dyke's at Wisconsin. He was at Miami last year. A lot of ups and downs, too many downs last year. Turnovers were just a big issue. I think it got to him mentally a little bit. We've seen both sides of him. I mean, he's, he's obviously got the potential to do really good things, but I think they need a strong cast around him, and they need a really strong start this year because I think he is a guy that has to shake those cobwebs of last year out. But if he starts feeling himself, man, like Wisconsin – is not going to be a program that just leans on quarterback. They're going to have good players around him, uh, good scheme, good plan, good culture in place. Year two under Luke Fickle. Maybe they do something this year. They got Bama in their week three. They go to USC week four. They've got Penn State. They've got Oregon. So they got a lot of the big boys they're playing this year. And lastly, but not leastly, Jalen Daniels is at Kansas. And there was all that talk about whether he'd go in the portal, and he didn't. The talk is about the back injury. If he recovers from that back injury and is able to be his former self, it seems like he's been forgotten. And if he's back to his former self, Kansas can win the Big 12. Like, Kansas could be a college football playoff team, point blank. You heard me right. And it would be possibly because of him, but also they've got a great schedule draw. So, you know, look, at this point, if Kansas is sneaking up on you, that's your fault. They do have a very interesting situation this year where they can't play at home. So they've got to play some games in Arrowhead, and they've got to play some games in a Sporting KC's stadium, I believe. Check me on the soccer stadium references there. But Jalen Daniels, yeah, 
He also, I think, belongs on this list. We've gone like an hour, four minutes. <laughs> Look, there are some people out there on vacation, and that's great. And there are some people out there who are choosing to just recognize the off-season. And that's wonderful. That's your constitutional right. But it's April right now. And if anything, we've added shows recently. Now, I did want to tell you this. I don't even celebrate my own birthday. So I wasn't going to make a big deal just because this is our 500th show. But this is our 500th show. And so I wanted to do a couple of things. I wanted to thank you. We didn't necessarily plan the confetti, but there's the confetti. And I also wanted to let you know that there's a whole lot coming to the show this year that you haven't seen before, but it's not bad. It's all good. And a lot of it's cosmetic. Uh, some of it will be content wise, but I just want to promise you, as I told you at the outset, when we started having success here, we're not changing anything about the show because that would be stupid because we're going to do what got us here. Number two, I can't really be specific on this, but I want you to know because of you guys, this is the most consumed college football show in digital media, and you've been able to change a lot of people's lives because of that. Whenever they want to tell that story, that's their business, but because of you listening to this show and watching this show, there are some people in good places now that may not have been in the best of places this time three, four years ago. So I thank you, because I'm one of those people, I thank you, but also they thank you, and they're not necessarily wearing a mic on camera or anything like that, nor do they desire to be. But we will not change anything about this. We will add to it. And uh, for example, you know, I told CBS a few years back when they asked, what would you love to do? Give an infinite resource, what would you love to do? I told them, oh, if you give me infinite resource, uh, we won't even be in Nashville during the spring. We'll just go live on campuses. I think they thought they were calling my bluff. Well, they gave us the resources. And we're on the road. We're hitting like 20 schools this spring. Just getting as, I, I'm trying to get you as much access as you can. Coaches have been great because most of them listen to or watch the show. A lot of the players out there have been great. So the other thing that's happened is we've been able to really, really refine the filter through which our information goes through. We don't have to guess anymore, in other words. We've got really, really solid sourcing to where we can shape the stuff that is said on this show in a manner that's accurate instead of throwing darts at a board. And I've done it both ways. Once upon a time back in Columbus, Georgia, I had the same access as anyone else did, and I guessed my way through it like everyone else did. It's much nicer to not have to do that. So a lot of personnel folks out there, a lot of coaches and players, we appreciate it. Uh, every one of you, we appreciate it. Onward and upward. We don't even remotely consider ourselves having arrived because I don't th really still think we scratched the surface of what the show can be. But it will always be formatted with you in mind. I do promise you that. So for our folks here, many of whom had to work overtime to even get this physical space ready, and that's very much appreciated as well. And our folks down in Fort Lauderdale, I'm Josh Pate. Uh, gonna do a Late Kick Extra on Tuesday. So that's podcast only. So make sure you're subscribed to the podcast as well as the YouTube channel. We'll be live Thursday. I'm going to be in Fort Lauderdale live Sunday. And then we'll be back on the road for three more Pate State Speaker Series destination stops next week. So um, they can call it the off season if they want to. We don't even recognize the word here. See you guys later this week. Until then, take care and God bless.